All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, JP and Ling, uh, Seth, can you guys hear me okay and see me? Yep, we're good. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. I think we'll get a few more people in, including a few people on our panel who haven't showed up yet. But uh, uh, really excited about today. This is my favorite open air project, and I'm not uh, afraid to say it. Uh, been some amazing progress for those of you who tuned in last uh, last time a couple weeks ago or have been participating in the forum. Uh, we made some great progress this week on the Epiphyte build. And so what today uh, we're going to do is uh, we're calling it Sorbent Week, but maybe we should call it Sorbent Panel Week, where we had amazing progress on kind of the heart of the system here and the design and wiring of it. And uh, JP is going to share some details with you. Um, as always, we have most of the Carbon Crowd team. Uh, we got Seth joining us from Washington. We got JP who's right there in Philadelphia, who's been in the lab at UPenn. Uh, for many hours over the last two weeks. Um, David and Chuck can't join because of conflicts. And I'm super excited to have uh, Ling, who you may have seen last week but didn't hear. She's going to be co-hosting and asking questions with me. Hey, Ling, how are you doing? Can you hear us? She was having uh, a little... Ling had to restart her computer. She was okay. having... So Ling will join on in a second. So great. So we'll go ahead and uh, get, get right into it. And again, the, the purpose of this is to report back progress from the very first build of the Hello World prototype of Epiphyte, which is our open source direct air capture system. Uh, all of the, the previous two webinars are on the Carbon Crowd website. If you click on the build or on the YouTube playlist, you can see where we've come from. Uh, maybe Ling or JP or Seth, you guys can go ahead and drop the Carbon Crowd uh, link in there uh, since I'm one, one hand uh, down here. So where we are now, just to give a little bit of a uh, progress report. We started off our first session back in August, where we just sort of presented the design, what we were trying to build, what our objectives are, and a little bit about the bill of materials that were just showing up at that time at UPenn's uh, Department of uh, Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, where we're building this first prototype. Then last time, two weeks ago, we got into, we had all the major parts of the, the sort of the mechanical system, and we, we, we bolted those together. So our fans and uh, other pieces of equipment. So the, the sort of the skeleton, the exoskeleton was built. And th today, one of the more time intensive and kind of critical pieces of this, as I said, is the sorbent panel installation. So David last week reported on the heating system for that, that he tested out. So what we did over the last two weeks is we built the full uh, panel and we inserted that heating system into it. So we've made that progress. And JP, who is there in the lab is going to give us some uh, some very specific updates on that. And so today, uh, oh yeah, what we're going to go into in, in up forward, this might change a little bit. Uh, tomorrow, I understand JP is actually putting the sorbent beads into the panel. So we'll report on that next week as well. But we're also getting into the, the software and sensor components of this where Seth will be uh, definitely um, uh, sharing some of his expertise there. And, and, and hopefully we've made some real, real good progress. And then if all goes according to plan, the, the last one we'll do will be the fully assembled unit. Uh, we will demonstrate it and we'll sort of reflect on the experience. We have a very special guest for that one. Uh, one of the biggest figures in, in direct air capture will be joining and sharing his thoughts and perspective. So for today, oh, here, sorry, I think I deleted a slide, but that's okay. Um, and then what we also have, uh, we've managed to twist Ling's arm, not with much twisting, uh, who's based out in the Bay Area. And we've decided that our next round of builds will be out in California. And the goal of that will be to replicate what we've done here. So this first one that we're doing, this Hello World, we just want to build the first one, make sure it works and create documentation. So now we want to see, and there might be a couple of optimizations we'll, we'll sneak into this build. But the main point is, can we have other people replicate it uh, using the resources and experience that we've developed uh, and with the support from the people who built it? Um, and we want to go for a minimum of two sites this time, certainly one uh, in Ling's backyard. If anybody is in San Francisco or the Bay Area and has an idea for a venue for it, a lab or a makerspace, let us know. We're going to be trying to lock that down in the coming weeks. But we also want to do at least one potentially in Southern California, maybe with Ling's sister's help. Uh, and I'd love to get one in Sacramento so we can trot this out to the Capitol for uh, advocacy purposes. 
And we'll also want to see, can we, we give ourselves two months, but if we can figure out a way with how much we've learned in our documentation to accelerate that a little bit, that'll be a measure of success. All right. So California, here we go. And now, uh, so yes, so what we'll be doing right now is just a general progress report, some scenes from the lab. Then JP will do a deeper dive into what the sorbent panel installation was like. And then we will hear from all of you and hopefully our special guest, who I know he was teaching a class and had to run here, but I'm sure he'll pop on in a few minutes, is the one and only Matt Parker, who's my fellow co-founder of Open Air. He's the other crazy guy who decided to embark on this journey with me four years ago. He's a game design professor at NYU and it's hard to summarize the number of things that Matt uh, contributes to the community to keep it floating. He's been very involved in R&D projects from the outset. Uh, he is also the brain and implementer behind the Carbon Removal Challenge. If you haven't heard of, we did our first one last year and doing year two. This is a university-based competition, almost kind of like the Solar Decathlon, but for carbon removal. And it just launched last week, and it's going to be amazing. So hopefully we'll see Matt in a little bit. But one of the reasons why we wanted to have Matt in here is he was one of the principal figures behind, before, uh, behind our very first open source DAC project before Epiphyte, and that's called Violet. And this is a, you can see a picture of there, which is in the garage of one of our members, Jeff, in New Jersey. And that's Matt standing next to it. Very different design. You can see um, similar uh, fans, uh, but otherwise it's a moisture swing uh, DAC unit. And we learned a lot from that project for, for, for good or for bad. And Matt in particular uh, took just in crazy steps to test sorbent, uh, often within his tiny little cooperative apartment in northern Manhattan. And uh, through that, he learned a lot about the ups and downs of trying to make sorbent work. And through that process, he actually developed a DIY sorbent tester, which you can see in the middle. So hopefully he will be here to uh, share some of the experience and give some, some feedback. All right. So, and then the last thing I want to just mention, and maybe JP, you can drop the link to this. Uh, we have a whopping uh, four followers because we just started it, but we are going to be communicating a lot about our progress on Instagram. We think that's a great way to build our community. So please do follow us. That's carbon crowd underscore OAC. And uh, we have a uh, tagline for this for social media, which is Epiphyte DAC. All right. That's where we are. Now back to Epiphyte. Uh, this has been an amazing thing to behold remotely uh, from the pictures. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, here's David, who can't join us today, standing in front of uh, the mostly constructed mechanical system for Epiphyte, which looks beautiful. And uh, what is just significant to think, it's very satisfying to see it go from something that was a, a slide on a PowerPoint to an actual thing in the world. And obviously we have a long ways to go, but it's now quite real. Um, so what I'll do is I'll ask JP who was in the room there and Ling uh, will hop in too. We're just going to ask questions and have a conversation uh, some of the scenes from the last couple of weeks. And we we uh, say that, as you put this up here, JP, that 50% of the work has been deep thought, a lot of figuring out on the fly. So what were you taking a picture uh, unbeknownst to David here? Uh, what was happening? <laughs> with uh... Yeah, so so this is the first time I think David brought a lot of the electronics that he was working with um, back at home. And so he's starting to think now about just how to, how is he going to wire it up, um, which is, even just that's the you know, even just the first step and then after that he's the also starting to think about how is he going to actually control the thermocouples so um how is he going to program and code so that we heat the sorbent up thoroughly um but don't overheat the system um we've also got you know a mix of safety mechanisms that are going to go in there um, so that if we do overheat, we cause a short circuit, like it's gonna, gonna trip a couple, um, sensors off and we'll be able to, to shut the system down. Um, so yeah, so he went and found a chair and was sitting there just staring at the electronics, which I'm way less familiar with of how is he was going to get it going. Um, and then the picture on the left here was, uh, by the end of the day yesterday, um, after I had left, he was actually able to, uh, hook up the heating element. Um, we're starting to run power through that. Great. It looks like he's diffusing a bomb on the right there. <laughs> uh, Lane, can you hear us? Uh, yeah. Can you? Can you? Um, I can't try my. Oh video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, also, people. Matt is here. What's that? Matt has been here the whole time. Oh, fantastic! All right, so let me go ahead and make you guys both co-hosts so that we can see your. Lovely faces. Uh, Matt is now co-host, and now Ling is also a co-host. 
uh, so you should be able to turn on. So, all right, great. So, Matt, how you doing? I gave you kind of a zany introduction in the beginning, if you heard it, but uh, great to have you here, my friend. Uh, looking forward to getting your feedback uh, in just a little bit. <laughs> really put me in my best light there. Really great. <laughs> great. Uh, hey, Ling, glad you're you're co-hosting with me here. Um, you, like me, have been watching with like uh, drooling as they've been making this thing. So pop in at any point uh, if there's uh, any kind of questions or thoughts you have. Yeah, definitely. Great. So this next one here is that the other, this is a bit of a riff on Edison's uh, line where it was 99 to one, but 50% hard work. You can see this is a very much a manual process of making stuff happen. So what, what are we looking at here, uh, JP? What are you guys uh, working on? Yeah, so the left over there, so I'm actually running those heating element wires. Um, and on the right is uh, Chuck making everything fit. Um, I, I think uh, not unusual kind of on your first build, especially when you're trying to move as fast as, as we are, is there's a lot of extra cutting and maneuvering and uh, drilling holes through things that we didn't intend to um, resizing a couple of pieces. Cause you know, we just bought this little HVAC box um, and now Chuck's trying to put it together and we had to drill out a whole bunch of extra rivets that were getting in his way. I had to make some modifications to the sorbent panel side. So these are all kind of the learnings we had in the first pass. Any, uh, any band-aids yet, bumped heads, uh, burned fingers? Uh, what, what are the casualties we've had so far from the, the hard work? Uh, nothing so far, and I hope to keep it that way. That's what I yeah, okay. My, uh, okay. my glasses are on. <laughs> awesome. Looks great. Um, all right, so moving into where we actually – my computer isn't frozen – so again, the centerpiece of this week here, I had to put that there for uh, JP because the expression on his face, uh, but it's this beautiful looking product that you have there. I think it just looks so unhomemade, uh, which is the sorbent panel, which is going to go right into there in between the two fans. And that's where the magic happens. So you can see a little sped up uh, video of um, JP putting that baby together uh, last week. And uh, JP, anything you want to sort of set up again, just describing a little bit about the sorbent panel and what had to have happen this week. And you can let me know when you advance the slides because you have some visuals for that too. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, the first big thing here was, you know, we designed the sorbent panel to fit very snugly um, within that, that box overall. And on the first attempt, it yes, it fit, but it was starting to bulge the box, which is going to be really difficult when we were trying to pull a vacuum on it and to seal it. So we had to, to trim it down. Um, so with the only available tool I had in the lab, the first set of 80-20 that I took just a quarter eighth inch off was with that little hacksaw. Um, that was so annoying that I just took all the pieces home so I could actually use my power tools and just brought it all back a couple of days later. Um, so I ended up trimming uh, just an eighth of an inch off. It was just enough where you still get kind of that snug fit, but we're not like bulging the seams and, and breaking the, the vacuum um, on it. Hey, JP, um, in hindsight, would you say that it would be safer to undersize um, that panel a little bit if you're not sure? And then would you, do you think it's possible to pad the edge of it with some kind of like more flexible material, like foam or something or silic silicone? Yeah, I think we could have just planned on undersizing a little bit and then just adding a gasket. Um, that, that would have worked well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I am kind of glad that we, because I think we kind of, we talked together of, undersize or like oversize a little bit and we're like well you know we, it's easier to cut it down than it is to to add extra pieces to it i think the snug fit is helpful um and just keeping everything in place rather than um it like bouncing around too much so definitely want a little bit more of a snug fit the mm -hmm. uh the kind of filter size that came in it, like this uh um this little unit that we bought wasn't the, wasn't the best work of engineering. Um, like even the filter that came pre-installed in there, it had spots where the air could just go over the filter. So it was, that wasn't even like sealed really well. Um, so I think, you know, yes, it was a pain in the butt, but the sizing was okay. We made that choice. 
What was the and, original filter for? What was that? What was the, the purpose of the original filter? Uh, it was like one of those uh, standard ones that you have in your like furnace unit. Um, so I don't I don't know why they designed this as a standalone piece, or you know maybe it was to hook it up into a, a larger HVAC system. But yeah, the yeah, filter kind of came with a four inch filter f that you'd put in your your home furnace. Yeah, the original filter had nothing to do with the project. We we bought the the duct piece for the outside. So that we can make a custom piece for the filter. Oh, yeah. I was just curious because, yeah, with, with these systems, I think that you don't want the air, as you were saying, JP, like flowing over or finding any gaps so that it's not going through the sorbent and you sort of have to tape it or, or gasket or caulk it or something so that you're forcing the air through the sorbent to, to get as much uh, uh, exposure and, and, and not getting the air path of, of less resistance around it so that you're not capturing the, the CO2. Mm. yeah um let me also do this as well i didn't say it at the beginning folks who are watching this here uh please do put any questions illuminating ideas thoughts you have in the in the q a that'll just be easier for us to track not that this is a huge uh gathering but put it in the q a uh because we really would love your your thoughts on anything we talk about if you have any any useful insights or ideas to share that's the the whole point and we'll we'll have that discussion shortly all right you want me to move to the next slide here uh go ahead JP? Yep. All right, here we are. Yeah, so uh, one of the decisions we made too was to leverage T-slot or, or AD20. Um, and that enabled us to kind of assemble different pieces, disassemble it, um, you know, as needed. So, you know, here's just part of the process that we were going through, um, you know, building out the, the panel. So the first time we, you know, just made the rect rectangular, um, outer edges, then we had to saw that down. Now adding some of the internal pieces, you know, and for the the screen that you're seeing there, that's going to hold all the sorbent in, you know, that didn't have any holes in it. We didn't have access to just the laser cutter. So had to press the screen together um, on that front panel and then just drill those holes separately. Um, so this is kind of the process of getting that first assembly on that front panel um, complete. So the 8020 kind of has like a Lego-like function. It gives you some flexibility to kind of click things together uh, without being too unforgiving if you take a <laughs> record, Is that right? Yep. It's like a it's like an adult director set. All right. I love it. All right. Uh, computer making ominous sounds. Okay. Let me just uh, move it forward here for you. All right. There we go. Yep, so here's just a closer up picture um, using L brackets to hold the different pieces in place. So we're looking at the, the backside of the panel right now. Um, and the backside, we purposely designed it not to be fully enclosed. So the actual panel is going to be just large enough to cover the, the sorbent panel there. Um, and the circle in yellow is highlighting, we're using the same bolt to hold the, the back and the front. Uh, together. So that was partially to, to save on costs and also just from, from the space that we had available. Um, and then in the green there, so those are clevis pins. Um, and really they're just there as a way for us to run the heating element wire around. So kind of in a close up, you know, it's just a little pin that goes straight through the, the panel. Then we have these little um, gaskets that went around it just so that we could run the wire kind of over and snake it through the area that will be the sorbent panel there. Awesome. All right. How did you do the gasketing? Did you um, have something that like in the tube or um, like, did you buy like a, like a strand of gasket? Um, around the, the edges, I didn't, mm -hmm. we did a, a uh, gasket or seal anything. Um, so the sorbent beads that we're using are like 1.6 millimeters. Okay. So we didn't, doesn't have to be perfectly sealed there. Um, mm -hmm. I think for any gaps that we have left, if we do need to seal any pieces, um, we have some like high temperature silicone that we'll use. Right, great. Awesome. Sorry, I remember the Epiphyte team was talking about the 
sort of sort of collecting at the bottom over time, like sort of uh, gravity eventually. Have you seen any evidence that I know this is build is different, so I'm curious if there's uh, any evidence of that yet. Uh, we'll let you know maybe next <laughs> next time around. Um, one of the things that we did differently specifically because of what Thursday saw was they were using like um, a really fine nylon mesh. So it was really pliable. The screen that we're using is metal and it's much stiffer. So we're hoping that there's, there will be some settling, especially once the motor gets running on the fan that we'll have. But hopefully if we have to, it's just, you know, pop off the back and we can add more sorbent in as everything um, settles together a little bit. Hopefully right. less of it. So this is a back of napkin or rather graph paper of the, the basic idea, um, which more just sort of sets the stage, but I don't know if there's anything you want to say about this somewhat. Uh, I can't read any of it, but uh, I can move on to the next slide too. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 these are the drawings that I received for where all the wires had to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had Ling who was able to translate like my chicken scratch into a great set of CAD drawings. <laughs> right. Um, you know, but, but part of this process was, you know, in a, in a kind of a company or corporate setting, you know, you might have design reviews and design controls and everyone gets together and you go through each specific aspect to make sure everything's going to work. Um, our approach is, is a little bit more like do it yourself, a little more hobbyist. And so there's different times where it's like, okay, I got mine done and now, okay, now we got to start thinking about the electronics and how are they all going to come together? Where do the wires actually have to run um, and stuff? So, you know, this was, I was double checking with David multiple times going back and forth, just one where, where these had to be placed. So I knew where to drill the holes um, in the, so we could have access for those sensors and thermocouples into the, into the sorbent panel itself. All right. Seemed to have worked. Well, we'll see. Here's a, an actual. Yep. So this is just the front side of the panel with, um, so you have the clevis pins are uh, where the red arrows are, and then um, the heating element wire is in the yellow. So as you'll see, you'll notice that there are two different sizes because I mismeasured before I drilled those holes. So, oh, I, part of the process. Yep. Yeah. Um, here's just kind of a, a loose schematic of where the uh, different sensors are gonna gonna be running through. Um, the plan is to run them uh, kind of behind the scenes through the channeling in the T-slot. So identifying that channeling of the T-slot with the yellow arrow there. And then on the bottom side of the sorbent panel and the lime green, so that's gonna be where the thermocouples are. So there'll be a couple that are attached to the nichrome wires and some that will be embedded in the sorbent. So that will give us the temperature readings. We'll be able to see how heat is transferring through the system. Um, as we start to heat everything up and that will also provide the input into David's um, control system. And then on the top side there uh, where the uh, little blue lines are, so that's going to be two thermistors. So one's going to attach to the nichrome wires on the front side of the panel and then the other one will attach to the one on the, the back side. Um, and those are specifically for safety. Um, so if they get too hot and register too hot, they'll shut down um, the power to the heating elements. So if we start to see heating run away, um, that's one of the mechanisms for safety that's getting programmed in. Yeah, so it's heat, carbon, and pressure. Those are the sensors we have embedded in there, is that right? Uh, within the sorbent panel itself here are just to measure the heat. Um, some of the other sensors are gonna be put in other places with inside the system all right uh lang what are you thinking is the person who we've uh we've convinced to build one of these Any, anything here uh to speak to from a future builder perspective or um um not much but um i would just say that like always cat it out because um i think after uh i cat it out i will ask questions like do we need um like like a thousand of these brackets and then JP was like, no, I think we can get rid of like a few of them to save money. Um, and they're, they're kind of expensive. There's not, they're not like that expensive, but they add up 
especially for a volunteer project. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is um, a question. Um, so there's no active or like constant um, temperature control in this, right? Just just the safety mechanism. So otherwise, the the sorbent can probably go as high of a temperature as it wants. Uh, I think from like a personnel safety, I, my understanding is that you're you're okay. But from like the effectiveness of the sorbent and sorbent degradation, if you heat it up. Um, too high then you'll permanently damage the the sorbent and it will lose its capacity so okay but uh, so there is some control yeah so there's kind of like the you have the release window of the temperature where it's going to release the co2 and then if you go too far out of the next range you'll start to to damage it um so the, mm -hmm. the temperature controls are important you know not only for just safety of the system but also just for the longevity of that that sorbent Okay. You okay. also got to worry about the sensors, right? You're going to fry those if you get too hot, even if mm -hmm. they're temperature sensors. Do you know what the, what's your target temperature? And do you know what the max rating for the temperature sensors is? I, uh, I would have to. Seth might know. Or someone else. <clears throat> Seth, do you know that by chance? Yeah, I don't know offhand, but I think the, mm -hmm. the temperature sensors, you know, we're, we're only looking at about 80 C. Is, is kind of the target for our heating and the temperature sensors go up you know, well above that. Uh, right. I'd be more concerned about the other sensors, right? Yeah. The, the pressure sensor, for example, may, uh, may not have that, that high range, but I don't, I don't think we'll have a problem with 80. Cool. And, and hopefully and the placement, the placement of the, we'll get into this at the yeah. next, two, but the placement of the pressure sensors, uh, should be far enough away from the heating element. I don't think it's going to get that hot. Okay. And JP, the, the sorbent beads are just going to go nicely into this square, just sort of right around the, the Lycrum wire. Is that right? Yep. We're going to just put, pour them in, shake them around a little bit, <laughs> let them settle and, you know, smooth it out. And then it will kind of be like a, you know, a mirror image on top. So there'll be another um, set of heating element wires and then a screen and then just the back panel and uh, bolt it down. All right, cool. Uh, Matt, do you have any uh, cautionary tales or lessons learned about how to treat your sorbet nicely or, or how it can break your heart? Uh, or maybe we can do that next week when, when we report on the actual results. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say um, whatever testing you can do before you put it in there to see, make sure that it's properly activated um, because we definitely had a number of times where we like, built the machine and then we're like we're not seeing much change in the co2 oh it turns out the sorbent wasn't prepped the way that we thought it was or was not as effective as it was so that's why we ended up doing a lot of stuff with our uh on violet with sorbent testers and various different incarnations of that and we had a simple sorbent tester and then a mega sorbent tester and uh what we were doing was was different in uh some uh, fundamental ways because we were doing moisture swing not uh, temperature swing um but yeah, just having at least some sort of proof of concept on the, you know, a few grams of the sorbent before you are trying it on massive quantities of sorbent would be my, my recommendation because we definitely uh, had some missteps down those roads where we're like, hey, why, why are we not seeing the CO2 changes we would expect in this situation? And then we take a small piece and be like, oh, this was not prepped in the way we thought it would be. Hey Matt, can you drop the uh the, the GitHub links to both Violet and the Sorbent tester? Uh, I don't have it free. Um, but one thing I want to say, if you if you're in our Discord and you go to the Violet channel, and I was today I was looking through that just to find a picture of Violet, and you just see the the log of Matt testing and not getting the result and testing and not getting the result, and then sometimes getting a result, it's like a mile long. So it just gives you a sense of uh how much iteration and uh back and forth was involved in that. All right, here's the next that's picture here. That's good to know, because I don't think we've really focused too much on... Uh, we just kind of bought it off the shelf, and we're like, well, I guess we'll see if it works. Yeah, what else can you do? I think you can. You talked about, though, a little bit. I mean, there were some very specific things that happened with the sorbet that we got from a source in China that, that explained mm -hmm. lots of our headaches. But, um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll be here for you as you guys... Uh, yeah, happy to, to, to talk about it. But, yeah, definitely... Um, 
yeah, we, as I said, we're working with different sorbents and we're working with the different swings. So uh, hopefully you will not encounter all the same problems that we did. But if you do encounter any problems, I'm happy to to talk to you through some of the uh, the issues we encountered. Yeah. And, and as a solar guy uh, who used to do installations, this is pretty good wire management here we're looking at. I like uh, how this fits together. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, just uh, as much as I, I can before I have to start drilling extra holes in, in the pieces. <laughs> I wanted to keep everything nice and clean, especially within the sorbent chamber itself. So this is just a mechanism for sealing the, the T-slot. Um, I have these little presses that go in. Um, and drilling holes in there to allow for the wires to run. So the wires, only the wire that you need will actually be in the sorbent panel. You know, then it's going to run out through the rest of the T-slot and those channels. Um, and like I said, I, we left the backside open so that we can kind of mount any electronics or make any connections that we need to leveraging kind of that real estate on the back of the sorbent panel there. Um, so makes that kind of interior space um, pretty nice and clean. Excellent. Cool. All right. I'm going to move on here. And here's just the picture of it with all the thermocouples kind of where they're going to be. Um, so next step is to uh, tape some of these down, especially the thermistors are getting taped to the wires because that'll be the potential for the hottest points. And then we'll start filling the sorbent in and we can kind of layer the thermocouples with where they need to go. And the um, sorbents, again, we showed a little bit last week, they um, they just look like little tapioca balls uh, in, in a way. And it's literally just a matter of pouring it out unless there's some treatment step uh, intermediary be between that that we discover between now and then. But the idea is literally just to pour that bottle into that cube, right, as is. That's my hope. <laughs> All right. We will see if anybody has any, uh, don't do that, or that's a good idea. Uh, please speak now or forever hold your uh, peace. Uh, it would be great to know. Yeah. I, th uh, I think someone in one of our earlier calls had mentioned the, the sorbent that we're using might also pick up a lot of moisture from the air. So if you have humid air, it's going to pick up more water than it's going to pick up CO2. Um, so that'll be something for us to kind of think about too. It'll be interesting to see in the context of that much heat that's going on though, if there'll even be that much moisture that's immediately around the, the sorbent, but we'll, we'll, well but it'll be cool when they're capturing, right? And heated. Uh, yeah. So uh, we, for Violet, we actually worked a bit with desiccants to try to uh, dry the air out at certain points in testing. So, um, you know, the ultimate design that we never got to because the, the, the sorbent was such a challenge for us was sort of modeled off of a desiccant wheel, which is like a thing that they do in uh, HVAC systems. So that like one side is constantly getting in our system, it would be uh, dry air and one side getting uh, wet air and you like rotate it around. So the sorbent sort of like in this chamber that rotates and it's like yeah. Yeah. absorbing for a long time and then desorbing for a long time. It just kind of comes around. In this case, it would probably be heat you know, and... I don't want to say cool, but not heat <laughs> um, going through part of it. But um, yeah, there might be an idea that you might want to do some sort of desiccant on the way in uh, when you're not heating it to try and uh, remove some of that moisture. We used... Um, Maybe for an MVP, we'll just get a, a home dehumidifier and yeah, pipe it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the first build, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but anything you can do to keep the moisture down in the room is going to do enough to keep the moisture down in the system, probably. Yeah. Was, that, sure that, was that a bigger deal for the fact that it was a moisture swing sorbent that we were using? It's probably more, even more critical for Violet, right? Than the yeah, presumably. Um, I, I'm not as knowledgeable about uh, temperature swing uh, DAC, so I'm not sure how much the moisture will interfere with the the sorbent's ability to to pick up uh, CO two, but uh, I guess based on what JP just said, I'm I'm guessing some. <laughs> so just just to define a couple of words there for those who aren't full on DAC geeks at this point, but there's different kinds of quote unquote sways that apply to different DAC technologies that are the the factors that really govern the absorption and release process of the CO two. The most dominant one by far is temperature swing, and that's where the, the you know capture and release is uh, subject to temperature changes. But there's also moisture swing, which is the swing is based on moisture uh, in the air, uh, electro swing, uh, as well as pressure swing as well. So I just want we're doing a we're doing a temperature swing here. All right. 
And then, all right, so that was day one. Well, you guys got a lot done on that one day. That's our beloved Chuck, HVAC. Yeah, I, I don't think we updated our piece of cardboard. I think this was like day five. <laughs> okay. Well, we just printed out a poster today, I think. So you'll see one yeah. on the wall. <laughs> we so. could track it a little better. But yeah, yeah I think this is uh, pretty reflective of kind of our our current state. A lot of the pieces are coming together. And now, uh, you know, the big next step is going to start to be integration. So once we get that, once we get the sorbent in, you know, now we can um, start looking at just how that sorbent is heating and David can kind of start programming the um, uh, the PID system and the control system for it. And, you know, then we'll start looking at, okay, what are the other sensors and components that we need to have? What about the control for the fans? And yeah, the integration work I think will be kind of its own beast because we'll go from kind of right now everyone's you know working semi-independently on different components and now it's all got to come together cool well what you should do jp if you can i don't know if it was planned for tomorrow this weekend the the putting of the sorbent in and, and actually running it for the first time do slap a little 60 or 90 second video of that and uh post it up to our instagram uh so that people can uh see that little bit of history which hopefully will be triumphant but if it's not that's okay then we'll just uh tweak and figure out how to solve the problem all right, so let's see. That might have been the last. Oh, here we go. So we'll just we'll end with this, and then I'll stop sharing, and then I'll share a, a slide at the end there about what's coming up. But so this is it. This is the very um, unintimidating, uh, boring-looking, magical bottle. Uh, again, remind us of what's in it. Uh, great question. Uh, <laughs> so this was uh, recommended to uh, us from Ed, who is another uh, member of of the team. You know, we were looking. So Thursday and the Octavia team were synthesizing their their own sorbent um, at this point because we were just trying to get to that early proof of concepts um, and didn't necessarily have access to, the, to a lab and I didn't want to make it in my kitchen. <laughs> um, that we, we, yeah, just tried to find something that was available, um, you know, and also chose one where we could use that metal mesh frame Um so I think these little pellets, they look like little pieces of rice are just a lot easier to control than if we were dealing with powder. There's a funny thing. So my wife is Indian and she she cooks a, a dish called sabudana, uh, which is a tapioca thing. And she's always soaking the sabudana before she makes it. And it looks exactly like our sorbet. I'll have to take a picture. <laughs> um, but uh, Lane, what are you, uh, anything uh, from you here? I know you're absorbing this uh, with an eye to building. I I have not much knowledge about sor sorbents actually. Um, is this feel like? Yeah. Is this mm -hmm. supposed to be? Um, do we have this on hand or or not it? Hand, right. Yeah. That's that's it right there. Uh, that's the bottle. That that's is, the bottle. Oh, yeah. well, it says coming soon, so I was confused. Oh, oh, okay. Coming soon, as in like coming soon into the panel. Yep. Yeah, we got it. And we'll probably have an extra one because I've accidentally ordered two. So we might even pop that in the mail and just okay. send it as well. So how much is that in that bottle? Uh, I think this bottle's half a kilogram. And like, so we have four bottles of it. It um, says one. One kilogram. one kilogram. Yeah, it, it came in two <laughs> bottles. I think the, the one kilogram order came in two, two bottles. Got it. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so let me go ahead and... Uh, bring the screen down. I could talk a little bit. Uh, Matt, because I didn't know you were on, um, I uh, didn't give you an opportunity to um, just very quickly uh, give a plug for the carbon removal challenge, if you can, uh, which is timed nicely with this. It might in intersect with Epiphyte, actually. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, first of all, sorry, I was like a, a little bit late. I was uh, rushing uh, over here, but uh, yeah, the carbon removal challenge. Can I share screen? Is that the, a thing? I, yeah, uh, go for it. Yep. Just quickly uh, share here. Yeah, the carbon removal challenge is our annual uh, carbon removal uh, competition for higher ed students. So uh, undergrad and grad students. Uh, last year was our first year. I'm not going to play this whole video now, but you should watch it. It's great. It was made by uh, one of our members uh, and sort of cal uh, goes through sort of a, a recap of last year's challenge. Uh, but last year we had uh, 28 teams from uh, 10 different countries on five different continents, uh, almost 160 students uh, uh, participate in the challenge. And 
Um, yeah, we're hoping to get more teams this year. Uh, we've got some great sponsors this year. Uh, the Carbon Unbound Conference is uh, one of our sponsors. So we're going to be hosting our final showcase at Carbon Unbound uh, and bringing the finalist teams to New York uh, to show off their work just like last year. So, uh, yeah, if uh, you're interested, uh, come to our site. We've got a little form you can fill out here, talk about how you're interested in uh participating or if you're an academic who just wants to be part of the team uh you can just click on the join the challenge thing and give us your information and you will uh, be in the challenge so uh we're going to be doing webinars we have one uh we're planning in october with frontier and rmi uh but uh, i don't want to use too much time so I'll, I'll wrap it up there but uh come come find us and talk to us yeah it's really such an awesome like it's just such an amazing initiative and you just absolutely crushed it last year with nothing. Uh, and so definitely take a look at the site there and look at the video that was made that kind of recaps last year, what we're doing this year. It really tells the story nicely. So, um, but Matt, any, any kind of, uh, initial thoughts being a veteran of, uh, open source DAC, uh, you know, you've shared some, some questions already, but, uh, you know, and also just say how cool of a thing this is. I must, uh, I must force you like, no, no, I, I, I feel I was appreciated cool. more than anybody. Given what you, you don't mean. have to twist my arm on that part. I mean, this is like already Epiphyte looks, uh, so much more, uh, you know, refined and obviously, uh, you know, the, 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 the build process on it, uh, you know, I, I, I we we played with getting 80 20 parts so many times with violet but it ended up uh, using more off the shelf stuff um so i'm a little jealous of uh of getting to 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 play with that and uh fitting everything together smugly snugly so i think you know one of the things that was a huge tripping point for us on violet was the the sorbent you know he showed those hilarious pictures of me all uh doing all those uh, chemistry experiments in my apartment and to be clear for the people watching i am not a chemist in any way uh took chemistry in high school was the last time I had any sort of formal chemistry education. And I got a C. It was like my only C in high school. It was definitely my worst subject. Um, but we had brilliant people on the team uh, who understood chemistry better than me and uh, told me what to do. Uh, but we still had like tremendous problems getting the sorbent going. So one of the things that excites me about Epiphyte is like, if this sorbent isn't it, doesn't work that well, it's just a matter of like opening up that cartridge and replacing it. And that was something that was a lot more... Uh, difficult with the way that we were designing uh, Violet and the sort of materials that we were working with. So, uh, you know, hopefully this sorbent will just, you know, work out of the box um, or out of the jar, container, <laughs> bottle. Um, but, uh, you know, with us, you know, again, we were doing an entirely different um, uh, catalyst for the the change in, in absorption of CO2. We were using moisture instead of uh, temperature, um, someday, hopefully, we'll get into electro swing as well. Um, but I do think that uh, the way this is designed is more flexible than uh, some of the stuff we were doing with Violet, and and that's really nice. And but my one question is, like, there might need to be some chemical prep that goes on for whatever sorbent you're working with, because that was a consistent uh, hurdle for us with uh, with Violet. But again, different uh, different kind of chemicals you're working with, different kind of the, I, I do, you know, whoever your your chemist on the team is, though, uh, we definitely made a lot of mistakes where we like reread the paper after the thing didn't work. I'm like, oh, you have to soak it eight times. It's not just once. You have to do it eight times at this temperature. You have to do this step and then this step. And we kept like, it's just in those technical papers on on preparing sorbent. There's a lot of little details and hurdles, and even it took us many iterations to get it right. And then even when we get, didn't get right, we had trouble repeating some of the lab results so uh yeah i wish you luck and uh hopefully things will go better than uh, than it did for us on the uh, sober side of things yeah, yeah thank you. and i would just say again if anybody we have a small next week we expect to have a lot more people because uh hackster has agreed to send out uh, a notification not next week in two weeks uh a promotion of this uh, our next webinar uh, that's where we host our bill of materials and stuff and they have a very large community so we expect to see more people uh, attend these events. But if anybody has any questions or thoughts, feel free to go ahead and share them either in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, Aaron, I see, has joined us, which is great. Open Air member based in Rockland County, uh, software guy. So we might tap you uh, as we go into the next two weeks because we're moving into software territory. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions. And while we wait for that, unless uh, Ling has another question, I just do have one kind of thing, you know, just to be very honest and open about this. Like, what are the what are the things that JP, you, Dave and Chuck are kind of 
keep you up at night a little bit, um, you know, or, or things that you're kind of biggest question marks uh, that kind of lie ahead before we, we wrap up the first prototype? Uh, I, I think a lot of it's going to be just this orbit of hmm. everything from the, the adsorption to the heating to the desorption, you know, and then are we going to be able to contain it, just, you know, extract it properly? Um, you know, put it under enough of a vacuum that we can get just a measurable, even just a measurable difference, I think, in, in CO2 concentration would be uh, a pretty good win because we can always build off of that. But g getting to that where you can consistently measure, even if it's just a couple percentage points difference in CO2 concentration. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty big unknown there. I think the rest of it is just kind of trial and error and optimization. Um, yeah, absolutely. And Mike Bondera is very much available even in real time if it's not, you know, it's nine hour difference uh, time zone wise or seven hours, eight hours, whatever. But hit him on WhatsApp. Uh, if you guys are in there for the critical moment, you want somebody to be there with you. Uh, that would be great. So David asked a question here and we all have different ideas on this. Me and Matt have shared an absolute, as he says, fever dream uh, about this. But David, who's an amazing uh, climate and carbon removal advocate, uh, now based in Maine, but from California. Um but um, glad you could tune in, David. Uh, is what do you expect to do with the CO two once it's captured? So I'll just give a first pass at that. For this one, it's just about making sure that the thing actually works. But we have some very creative ideas. Ideally, what we want. I look at this as three levels. I'd like to put a solar panel as a canopy on top uh, because this plugs into a wall, and then on the bottom, if you see the cart that we showed before, that's an empty space down there, and that's where I'm hoping some storage solution would happen and there are routes we could take that are around rapid mineralization which would be incredibly cool another member at ut uh, austin in texas where i live built a dac unit last year which he's open sourcing where he he was actually putting it into an algae tank and then drying the algae so that will be the fo focus of multiple builds over time is about how do we come up with different ways of storing it right integrated into the unit itself so but one anybody have any ideas what one of, one of the finalists last year the team from uh, university of waterloo had a, that was their their design was actually a deck that fit into an algae tank uh, as well so similar uh, approach there oh you got to um, connect this i'd love to have them jump in um yeah i was just emailing them uh, recently so remind me and i, I can uh, uh hook you up um you know one of the uh the one of the fever dreams that we, we've discussed and, and worked on in multiple ways uh was uh trying to put it into filament for 3d printing so captured co2 that you mineralize and put into filament uh there was actually um carbon upcycling uh that produced uh, the uh awards for the carbon removal challenge last year uh has a filament that is i think 10 percent captured carbon or 15 percent, something like that mm. um so the first actually to, to produce something like that so that's a that was the fever dream that, that chris was referring to before where i literally like had the flu and had like a 104 fever and i had a dream at night with the dac machine with like a filament coming out of it and going into a 3d printer which that that version of it may never be possible but uh you know maybe some intermediary intermediary steps for that um uh, we've talked a lot about uh, DAC soda. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, just like integrating an Airstream right into that baby, uh, yeah. which would be good. Yeah, I think we also have um, on the filament side, that's why it would be interesting. I don't know anything about filament making, but it's obviously an industrial process, but there are some DIY ways of doing that. And there's some Israeli researchers, I can't remember which university, that have done tests of using 30% calcium carbonate in filters. And we could produce calcium carbonate so for me, it would be so amazing when you look at that cart that we have there, that's a 3D printable object. And so imagine if you had an epiphyte that the cart was made out of 3D filament that is actually has captured carbon from an epiphyte in it, you know? So this is the kind of crazy shit that we talk about here. So <laughs> that's our job. So um, we'll see with people's bright ideas, we will figure out ways to uh, st store the carbon and do cool things with it. So great. Um, okay, well, we're going to document it on Instagram, the use of the uh, the sorbent, the first run of that, and any good news or bad news. It's all good news because we're trying to figure it out. But maybe we can just look ahead a tiny bit in the remaining minutes here. Um, I, sorry, just yeah, jump in for a minute about the, the bad news being good news part. Yeah, yeah, uh, please. 
Yeah, I think that is a really crucial, important part. And I think it is easy to get discouraged when you like run into like, oh, we tried this thing and it didn't work right away. And then you tried for a long time and it didn't work for a long time. And, uh, you know, I think the people you want your every experiment to be successful. But, you know, looking at Thursday has been a big thing for the Violet team um, that we are really excited. That a lot of the things that we did, like we pruned branches of the tree for them to help them. Uh, get to where they were. And they use a lot of the parts and components and approaches that we had for Violet in making that first Thursday unit. And so that's part of the reason also that we're, the Violet team's excited about Epify because it's like a continuation of like, you know, uh, we like to think that our failures led to other people's successes uh, and uh, help them get to, to where they're going. Uh, and a related note, last week when we did the launch for the carbon removal challenge, uh, it was at the Activate uh, demo hall where they were showing all the work from Activate Fellows who are like postdocs who are starting doing startups around different climate tech. Uh, and one of the uh, fellows who I didn't realize was gonna be there, uh, was Yang Shi, who I had met like two years ago as a postdoc um, at Columbia. And he now has a startup called Arbin, which is very clever. It's like, you take out the C, you take out the carbon and it's Arbin. Um, <laughs> but it's a moisture swing DAC system that is uh part of activates fellow uh, fellowship program now and uh, becoming a startup and he talked about how working with open air was a huge help to him in his work and got him to where he was uh you know being like working with us and being on uh cdr horizons um so yeah even if you don't like immediately capture a ton of co2 literally um out of this machine that you know he just successes will come out of that uh, if you keep going Absolutely. Yeah. Boy, is that the case? That's the case that everything open air does. I mean, if you look at the first bill that we wrote, Lecla, it was so childish and silly. And now it's a law in two states, you know, and it's all very iterative and you, you have to change things as you go. So let's do this, though. Ne by our next uh, session, we will a lot will have hopefully changed. Uh, we, we have the, the storm will go in. We'll have some results for that. But then, as I said, we're really getting into that sensor install and the software so if any any software people out there that want to help i did put my email in there Just email me and i'll direct you to the right people but um seth not to put you on the spot because we didn't talk before but I, I don't know if you could paint a little bit of a picture again about the sensors that we're using and uh how they'll be integrated anything you could share even high level would be would be good yeah so i mean you had it uh, right earlier so we've got basically the temperature sensors pressure sensors, and then the CO2 sensors. And the CO2 sensors is, is kind of obvious, right? We want to put one before the sorbent panel, put one after the sorbent panel, and make sure that the, the CO2 concentration is dropped. Um, pressure sensors are going to go um, more in that in that plenum sort of chamber. Uh, and the idea there is that we're going to use that to, to work the fans, right? We need to make sure that, that the pressure is not too high. We need to have those in there. We're not we're not really pumping out uh, for vacuum now, uh, but future builds are going to, and we're going to need those pressure sensors in there. So some of what we're doing is is putting the sensors in for future builds that we're not actually using uh, too much this time. Um, and then uh, you know the temperature sensors are, are you know really key to making sure that that we're hitting the right temperature to uh, desorb the CO two and to make sure that we're not putting the system in danger and, and to, as as really the the control mechanism for the whole system so you know they're they're there for safety they're there for control they're there for uh eventual mrv yeah and i will say that's a essential part i mean those does anything with cdr you have to be able to show that the work is happening and the, it's just so important from knowing it's working, whether or not it can be monetized as carbon credits. So this this piece, this really kind of digital software piece with some hardware is, is an essential part. But I also have the crazy idea, let's say by next summer, we have figured out a storage system. Uh, we bring in some of the other geniuses at open air like Heather, and we develop a protocol for MRV, as well as an L a life cycle analysis. Then if we spend next summer, we build thousands of these with different teams. Like then could we actually possibly sell carbon credits in a distributed sort of fashion that could then pay for future builds in a, in a, in a truly circular way. So these are the kinds of ideas we are entertaining here in the carbon crowd. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we'll get to something like that. Many surprises will come along the way. 
Uh, Ling, any any final thoughts before I uh, just talk a little bit about what's uh, what's next week or in two weeks? I should stop saying next week. <laughs> um, not like specifically on Epify, but um, I do I do want to sell Open Air a little bit because um, we always have a lot of projects going on. I like cannot be a part of all the projects because there are so many. But um, if anyone's here is not involved in open air um there's all kinds of projects to get involved in like my sister is involved in um like what's it called um, for our big bill in california yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and then um and then also what's great is that these projects are open source and so um if anyone gets stuck we can always consult each other and that's the way to go faster with um development yeah, thank you, Lane. Yeah, really excited it. about it. A lot going on in open air. What we hope is that Carbon Crowd becomes a focal point so that a lot of people can see. So when projects get to a certain level of maturity within open air, just organically through members interacting with each other, and they want to make it more public, and they want to get more eyeballs, and they want to start building things, that's what Carbon Crowd is, this extension of open air that's a platform for that purpose. So Epified is the first one. Next session, I will be able to tell you about two other tracks, two other projects that will be put on the carbon crowd. One is an R&D project and one is actually a legislation. So we're building legislation together uh, through carbon crowd. So I'll have more details on that next week. But these are the ways that you could be involved and stay involved is definitely tune in. Uh, I'll show the date in a second. Uh, on the carbon crowd website, which I think stupidly, I forgot to put the link for that in there. If someone wants to drop it, carboncrowd.cc. Uh, you can um, click on uh, the build for it and see that there's the forum. So if you have some idea and you want to kind of share it and talk with some of the team, that's the place to do it. Discord is our native home. Uh, it's insane. It's crazy. But people talk there and a lot of people meet. Uh, you can join that uh, just by filling out a form on the Open Air website, openaircollective.cc. And then definitely if you're in Philly, stop by. Uh, get in touch uh, with us and we'll tell you where to go. We are going to have a party uh, at the end of this, for this build, that every build that we do, we will do a party so people can kind of come in and see it. We might take it out in town and roll it around a bit and see what people say. But uh, lots of ways for people to get involved, and that's the whole point. If people aren't getting involved, then it ain't happening. And then uh, next week, this is my uh, little dark humor here. Uh, the post of I think hopefully we won't blow up you, Ben, when we insert the disorbent, but that will be on October 12th. Uh, same time, uh, and hopefully you guys can tune in. We'll have a special guest then, too. So, JP, thank you for holding down the fort. Uh, everybody else for uh, giving input, and thanks, folks, for joining, and please do be uh, be involved. See you later, everybody.